Hi, I'm Pete Krause with Modern Cardboard, and if you're ready to learn Scythe solo against the automated opponent called the Atoma, and learn what all the hieroglyphics do on the Atoma's card, then you're in the right place. So I'm ready to get started, and I hope you are too. This video assumes that you already have knowledge of how the rules work for the multiplayer game in Scythe. If you need a refresher of these rules, then see the first video in the series, where I put a link to that down in the description. Setup for the solo game in Scythe is a little different from how setup works for the multiplayer game. First, your opponent, the Atoma, doesn't get a player mat, just a faction mat. You can choose any faction for the Atoma, but for the first game or two, or more if you're like me, it's recommended to choose a faction whose home base is far away from yours. So in this case, I'm Crimea, and for the Atoma, we'll choose Nordic. Once you've selected a faction mat, move the Atoma's power marker and collect combat cards as shown on the mat. Now you don't want to peek at these combat cards you draw for the Atoma. Just place them face down next to its faction mat. Place the Atoma's 6 stars and 4 mechs on its player mat. Place two workers on the territories connected to the Atoma's home base. Since the Atoma doesn't have a player mat, you'll place the rest of its workers on its faction mat. The Atoma gets five coins to start the game. Place the Atoma's popularity marker on space number 10 of the popularity track. This is another difference for the Atoma. This marker is going to stay in this space and doesn't move for the rest of the game. Choose one of the four Star Tracker cards for the Atoma and place a technology cube on the space marked with a Roman numeral 1. You can see that each one of these has a different difficulty. In this video, I focus on the normal Atoma rules, but I'll point out one difference if you play with the easy rules. Shuffle the 19 Atoma cards and make sure all the cards in this deck face the same direction. Then place them face down and you'll need to leave room for two different discard piles next to them. Place these Atoma quick reference cards nearby. They come in really handy, especially for your first couple games. When playing against the Atoma, treat the factory cards like you're playing a two-player game. So you'll shuffle the factory deck and deal three cards here. And then lastly, place the Atoma's character on its home base. When playing a solo game against the Atoma, the way your turn works is almost the same as it would work in a multiplayer game. However, the Atoma's turn is quite a bit different. The Atoma doesn't use a player mat. On its faction mat, it's not going to use the faction ability, nor does it use any of these mechs abilities. The Atoma doesn't produce resources. It places stars a little different than you do on the Triumph track, and it moves quite a bit different than you do. So next, let's look at the big picture of how a solo game in Scythe works. And then after that, we're going to look in detail of how you take the Atoma's turn. So when playing against the Atoma, you'll always get to take the first turn of the game. After your turn, then you'll take a turn for the Atoma, where you'll flip one of these cards over and resolve the instructions listed on it. Similar to the multiplayer game, turns alternate until either you or the Atoma places your or its sixth star on the Triumph track, or near it, in the case of the Atoma. When that happens, the game is immediately over, and then you collect your end of game coins and tally up the final score. So let's look closer at what you do when you take a turn for the Atoma. After you flip over one of the Atoma cards from its deck, you'll see that there's a green side of this card called Scheme 1, and it's noted with the Roman numeral 1. And then there's a reddish-orange side of this card known as Scheme 2, and that's noted with the Roman numeral 2. At the start of the game, you'll only focus on this Scheme 1 in green for the Atoma, and you can completely ignore what's listed in Scheme 2 in this reddish-orange section of the card. Later in the game, these cards get reshuffled and rotated 180 degrees, where from that point forward, you'll only focus on Scheme 2, the reddish-orange section of the card for the Atoma's turn. So think of each line and the star in the center of this card as four phases for the Atoma's turn. The top line of this card tells you which Atoma unit you'll move. The second line tells you what the Atoma gains. The third line tells you what recruit bonuses you earn, if any. And then the center star tells you whether or not to advance the tracker cube on the star tracker card. If there's no red X covering the star, then you advance the tracker cube. And if there is a red X covering the star, then the tracker cube doesn't advance this turn. To get a quick idea of how the Atoma's turn works, I'm going to take one right now. I flip over the top card of the Atoma deck. I start with the top line, which says Move Worker. We're going to look at this action in just a minute. 
So using the rules for move worker, I move the Atoma's worker one territory. The next line shows what the Atoma gains, and that's two power. There's nothing on line three, so then we just advance the star on the tracker card one space. And then it's back to my turn. As turns progress for the Atoma, sometimes the tracker cube moves and sometimes it doesn't, as we've seen with the star in the center of the Atoma card. So when the tracker cube needs to move, and it's at the end of the row, you move it down to the far left space on the row below. When the cube reaches this space with the Roman numeral 2, you'll place one of the Atoma stars next to the Triumph track, and that's the point where you'll shuffle the discard pile back into the Atoma deck and then rotate it 180 degrees. From this point of the game until the end, you'll now use Scheme 2, this reddish-brown section of the Atoma card, and ignore the Scheme 1 green section. Now how the Atoma places stars throughout the game works in a couple different ways. The Atoma places a star when it reaches 16 on the power track, when it defeats you in combat up to two times, similar to how it works for you, and then it will place a star next to the Triumph track each time the Tracker Cube advances to one of the squares on the Star Tracker card with a filled in star. If the Atoma places its 6th star on the Triumph track, the game ends immediately just as it would for you, and again you collect your end of the game coins and tally up your score. The biggest difference with end of game scoring is that the Atoma only scores for its stars and territories it controls. It doesn't score for resources since it doesn't produce or control any. For you, the only difference in scoring at the end of the game is that you can only score for a maximum of 6 resources per territory. So hopefully that gets you a pretty good overview of how the solo game works inside. Next, we're going to dive in deeper to what all these hieroglyphics mean on the Atomas card, so that way you can take the Atomas turn after your turn. So when you take the Atomas turn, you'll start with line 1 as we've seen before. This line provides 1, 2, or 3 options for moving Atoma units, with options being divided by a slash. Now even though there may be more than one option on this line, you're only going to move one Atoma unit per turn. You start with the leftmost option, and if that's a valid move for one of the Atoma units, you move that unit, ignore the rest of the options on that line, and move down to line 2. If the leftmost option is not a valid move for the Atoma, then move the next option to the right and see if that's a valid move. If you get through all of the options on this line and none of these are a valid move, then the Atoma doesn't make a move for the turn and you move down to the next line on the card. So like I said earlier, the Atoma's units move differently than how you move your units. In general, the Atoma takes a unit closest to its home base or on its home base and moves this to the neighborhood of another one of its units, many times expanding closer to the factory in the center of the board. The neighborhood of a unit simply means either the territory the unit occupies or the territory that that unit could move to one space away. For instance, the neighborhood of this Atoma worker is this territory, this space, and this space, because it could move to both of these in one move. Now this is early in the game for the Atoma, and the Atoma hasn't yet unlocked the ability to cross rivers or enter lakes. When the tracker cube is on any one of these spaces with this little water symbol with a red slash through it, that means the Atoma can't yet cross rivers or enter lakes. Once that symbol doesn't exist on the space the cube occupies, then it's fair game to cross rivers, and then the Atoma can enter or even occupy lake territories with any of its units. For an example of a neighborhood after the Atoma has unlocked the ability to cross rivers and enter lakes, for this worker here, its neighborhood would be the space it occupies, and then every adjacent territory to that worker. Now that we know this, let's see how to move Atoma's units. Now, remembering how the Atoma's units all move and all the details of the turn is pretty challenging. At least it was for me in my first few games. So I really recommend using all of these quick reference cards. They have this gray back on them. Let's just say mine are well worn. So we'll start with the symbols on this first line that tell you that you have to move the Atoma's character. The first symbol we see here on the left means the Atoma will either try to pick up a factory card if it doesn't already have one, or pick up an encounter token. So if we look at the encounter factory quick reference card, it says select the Atoma character and the Atoma characters on the home base. Then we have to find valid hexes. 
and it says in neighborhood of any Atoma unit. So there's two workers and the neighborhood for those, because the Atoma hasn't yet unlocked the ability to cross rivers or enter lakes, is just going to be on this peninsula. For this worker, it's this territory, this one, and this one. For this worker, it's the same thing, this territory, this one, and this one. So for valid hexes, it would be a neighborhood that contains the factory, which is not here, but we do have one, a hex with an encounter token. Next, it says pick up the character, choose the destination hex. We use our valid hex, and there can't be an enemy unit or an Atoma mech there, which there's not. And step five on here, it says place character on the destination hex, which is right here. So we place it there. Now, if the Atoma's character is on a space with an encounter token, you always just discard the encounter token, and that just means you have one fewer to explore on the board. Now, if on a later turn, when the Atoma unlocks the ability to cross rivers and enter lakes, it has a couple more units, like this mech and this worker, it would have a couple different options. If the Atoma didn't already have a factory card, it would choose this as its priority, because it's in the neighborhood of this mech, and there's no enemy units or mechs on that space. So it would move here, and then it would just take one of the factory cards at random, now the Atoma can't use that factory card, it just takes one and gives you one fewer to choose from during the game. If the Atoma already had a factory card, then it would have this valid hex and it would move here because there's an encounter token that hasn't been taken already, and it would discard that. Let's say if it was early in the game and the Atoma hadn't unlocked the ability to cross rivers or enter lakes, and it had already removed this encounter token, then you would skip this turn because there would be no valid territories for the Atoma to move to. And then you go to the next one on the card. And that's the symbol we're gonna look at right now. And that one means move the Atoma's character. So for an example of a move character action for the Atoma, you're gonna select the Atoma's character like we did before, and then you find valid hexes. And this can be in the neighborhood of any Atoma unit, in the neighborhood of the Atoma's base even in this case. There can't be an enemy unit on that space or no Atoma mech on that space. So these would be valid hexes. This would be a valid hex. The hexes with workers are also valid next to the home base. These are valid hexes over here as well. And so when you're looking at valid hexes, you even look at the valid hexes around the unit that you're going to move or could possibly move. Then it says pick up character and then choose the destination hex. And this is going to be one of the valid hexes we looked at, but it has to be the shortest distance from an enemy combat unit. And so if we look down on the map just a little bit, we'll see that there is an enemy mech right here. That's my mech. And so the territory that's closest to this enemy mech it's gonna be this one right here, one space away. Now you'll see that step six and seven of this card do a lot of what we saw in the last Atoma action. If the Atoma's character was on a territory with an encounter token, it would pick that up and discard it. And if it was on the factory space and didn't have a factory card already, it would take one at random and put that next to its faction map. The next move action we'll look at for the Atoma, and let's say this is a different turn, is the move mech action. The move mech action for the Atoma is actually very similar to the move character action we just looked at. The difference is, is that if the Atoma has more than one mech out there, we have to decide which one we have to move. So if we look at the quick reference card, it says select the Atoma mech closest to the Atoma's base. The Atoma has two mechs on the board at this point one in this territory, and one in this territory. Since this one is closer to the home base for the Atoma, this is the one we're gonna move for this move action. Mechs, just like characters, are trying to move closer to an enemy combat unit. And so the valid hexes are in the neighborhood of any Atoma unit, in the neighborhood of the Atoma's base, there can't be any enemy unit on the space, no Atoma combat unit can be in that space either. So that means the Atoma can't have a mech or the Atoma can't have its character in that space. So we're gonna pick up the mech and it's this one because it's closest to the home base. And then for the destination hex, this is one of the valid hexes that's the shortest distance from an enemy combat unit. So this is the space this mech is gonna move to. And the reason why is it's in the neighborhood of the Atoma's character there's no character or mech that occupies this space, 
and it's closest to my character and my Mac. So if we took that same example, but in this case I didn't have a worker here, then the Atoma would move its Mac to this space. And the reason why is there's actually two valid hexes it could move to. This one and this one. They're both one space away from one of my combat units. But then we use the tiebreakers. The first tiebreaker is the hex that's closest to the factory, and this one wins out. Now if there was a second tiebreaker needed, then you'd go reading order, and that's left to right, top to bottom. So the next move option for the Atoma is the move worker option. Atoma workers move differently than what we saw for character and mech movement for the Atoma. They really just want to move to a rather safe territory, and they like to spread out so there can only be one Atoma worker per territory. So if we look at the move worker quick reference card, the first thing we have to do is select an Atoma worker. This is going to be the one closest to the Atoma's base, and a tiebreaker would be in reading order. So these two workers are close to the Atoma's home base, and if we go in reading order, left to right, top to bottom, we take the one from this hex, and then we're going to move it to a valid hex. So let's look at that next. Valid hexes would be in the neighborhood of any Atoma unit, or in the neighborhood of the Atoma's home base up here. There can't be any enemy unit in that space, and no Atoma worker, so that would rule out these territories. Now we pick up the worker, and choose a destination hex, and that's going to be one of the valid hexes we looked at in a neighborhood with the most Atoma units. And there can't be any enemy units in the neighborhood. So if you remember, I said the Atoma workers like to go someplace pretty safe, surrounded by a lot of their other units. We have to look for the hex with the most Atoma units in its neighborhood. I couldn't put that worker here or here because there's an enemy in its neighborhood. If I go here, there's one, two other units in its neighborhood. If I go here in the factory, there's one, two, three, four units in its neighborhood there. I can't go in a spot with another worker. If I look at this lake here, this looks promising. There's one, two, three, four, five units in the neighborhood of this lake. And so that's the spot with the most Atomi units in its neighborhood. And that's where that worker goes. And there can't be any other worker on that territory, which there wasn't, and no enemy units in that neighborhood. If there was a tie for the hex that that worker moved to, then you'd put that worker in the hex closest to the factory, or the second tiebreaker is choose reading order. That takes care of the basic move actions for the Atoma. So now let's move on to the attacking moves. So the first one we're going to look at is an attack move against one of my workers. So this means a combat unit is going to try to move into a spot with one of my workers and run them off and chase them back to the home base. So the first thing we do is select the Atoma combat unit. And this is going to be the combat unit like we've seen before, either closest to the Atoma's home base or on the Atoma's home base. So the one closest to the home base is here. That'll be the one we move. Next, we look for valid hexes, and this is in the neighborhood of any Atoma unit or in the neighborhood of the Atoma base. And now to narrow it down significantly, it has to contain one of the enemy workers or one of my workers, and there can't be any enemy combat unit in that space. The only workers of mine that are in the neighborhood of an Atoma unit are these workers here. So these are the only two valid hexes. And the hex that it goes in is the hex that has the most resources out of those two that are available. So these are my two valid hexes, and this is the one that has one resource, so that's going to be the one my mech goes to. Now once the Atoma combat unit is in a place with my worker, my worker is going to retreat back to my home base. And then the Atoma unit returns any resources on that hex back to the supply. And as a reminder, the Atoma's popularity always remains at 10. Even though my worker retreated to its home base, the Atoma doesn't lose any popularity. The next attack move we look at is an attack move against one of my combat units. And by the way, if you see this little symbol with the circle and the red X over it, this symbol only applies if you're playing the easy level. If you are playing easy and you encounter this symbol, then you would skip the whole turn for the Atoma and just go back to taking another turn. If you're playing any of the other levels, like we're playing normal, then ignore this symbol. 
The way you read the option for the attack move versus a combat unit is you look at the number and if the Atoma's power is at that number or greater, in this case a 6 or greater, then the Atoma would try to move and attack one of my combat units. If the Atoma's power is less than 6, then you skip this option and move to the next one, and in this case that's an attack move versus one of my workers. Alright, but in this case, let's say the Atoma's power is at 7. So that means it's going to go ahead and try to move one of its combat units to attack one of my combat units. So the first thing we do is select an Atoma combat unit closest to the Atoma's base or on the Atoma's home base. And in this case, this mech is the closest unit. Next, we look for valid hexes. Now the valid hexes could be in a neighborhood of any Atoma unit or in the neighborhood of a Atoma's home base. But we're going to narrow this down significantly because the territory has to contain an enemy combat unit. And so there's only one neighborhood that does, and it's this one right here. It's in the neighborhood of this character and the Atoma's mech. So we pick up this mech and we're going to put it here. So if there's more than one spot that was valid and maybe this spot had two combat units of mine, the Atoma is going to choose a spot with the fewest combat units. Now just like in the multiplayer game, when movement ends and there's two combat units of opposing factions in the same territory, combat ensues. And that's what we're going to look at next. Now in the multiplayer game, instead of both players choosing their combat power and their cards at the same time, you choose your power and your cards first. And in this case, I don't have any cards. I have five on the power track, and so I'm going to spend all five of mine. The reason you do that first is because it's going to be a surprise to you when the Atoma reveals its power that it's going to spend and the combat cards it's going to spend. So if you remember during setup for the Atoma, I said leave space for two separate decks. What you do for the Atoma is you draw the top card and you're going to set it in a separate pile. I turn mine sideways because I'm just looking at this little table on the bottom. So if we look at this combat card, we can figure out how much power the Atoma is going to spend. And if we look at the table, it says that if the Atoma has power between 0 and 7, it's going to spend 7 power. If it has between 8 and 13, it spends 7. And if it has 14 on up, it spends 7 as well. So it's spending full power on all of these options. You'll see on some other cards, it's not quite this high. So it looks like I'm going to lose. The other thing that we see on this card is how many combat cards it's going to spend. And in this case, it's just going to spend one. So we move the Atoma's combat dial up to seven and add its combat card. And now we finally reveal it as we didn't know what this was before. So we see in this case, I lose it with five power and the Atoma spends seven plus two equals nine. So the Atoma wins this combat. So you adjust the power markers accordingly after the combat. Then you discard any combat cards, and in this case it was just the Atoma's combat card. Then since I lost, I retreat my unit back to my home base. And just like in the multiplayer game, the loser collects a combat card. Even if the Atoma lost, the Atoma would collect a combat card too. So I get one. And then if there were any resources in this territory, those resources would go back to the supply. So that's what happens if the Atoma wins a combat. Now let's look what would happen if I would win the combat. In this case, let's say I won. I spent 5 power and played a combat card with a value of 5 for 10. And this was against the Atoma 7 plus 2 equals 9. So in this case, I would have won. And when the Atoma loses, rather than putting the Atoma's combat unit back on its home base, it actually goes to its faction mat. And then don't forget the Atoma gets to collect a combat card when it loses. Again, we would both adjust our power markers depending on how much power we spent. Now let's see what happens if I invade a territory one of the Atoma's units occupies and I win or drive off workers. So in the case I moved here and drove off this worker, I would lose one popularity, but then I would also gain resources. To see what resources I gain, I'm going to look at the top card on the Atoma discard pile. And so the card I'm looking at is the card on the main discard pile, not the combat discard pile. And if we look at this box here, it shows us how many resources we gain for this victory. Either I drove off a worker or I defeated an Atoma combat unit, and these are the resources I gain. So in this case, it shows me I gain two. And the type of resources you gain matches the territory that you're in. By the way, if I was in the factory or a lake, I wouldn't get any resources because those don't produce. So in this case, I gained two wood. Let's say on a different turn, I defeated this mech in combat. 
The mech would get driven back to the faction mat as we've seen earlier, and the Atoma gets a combat card, but in this case I would again collect resources. In this case I would just collect one. And in that case it would be an oil, because I'm on a tundra territory. The last thing I have to talk about on line one is if you see one of the options surrounded in these brackets. The brackets mean this option only applies if the Atoma is playing the faction shown by this symbol here. If the Atoma is not playing that faction, then move on to the next option. So if you're like me, you thought, that's a lot to learn on line one. Well, like I said earlier, the rest of these lines move a little bit more quickly. So let's move on to line two, and that shows what the Atoma gains. The Atoma can gain power, coins, workers, cards, and then also deploy mechs and or its character. Power, coins, and cards are pretty self-explanatory. But let's look at workers. When the Atoma deploys a worker, you take a worker from its faction mat and place it on its home base. If there's no more workers remaining on its faction mat, then you just skip this. This symbol means that the Atoma gains either its character back from its faction mat or a mech from its faction mat. If the character is on the faction mat, then you move the character from the faction mat to the home base. If the character is already on the board, then you move one of the mechs from the faction mat, doesn't matter which one, from the faction mat to its home base. Remember, the Atoma does not get to use the mech abilities as stated on its faction mat. The third line, or phase as I like to call it, shows you what recruit bonus, if any, you'll get. In this case, if I played my recruit and uncovered the card icon, I would gain a card on this Atoma's turn. So for the Atoma's turn, I flip over the top card of the Atoma deck, and the first option shown here is the Encounter Factory option. And if you recall, that option means that the Atoma character is either going to try to get the Factory card or an Encounter token. In this case, the Atoma's character is in the Factory space and already has a Factory card. So for valid hexes, we're looking for a neighborhood hex of an Atoma unit that has an Encounter token. That Encounter token's been taken and so has that one. So there's no Encounter tokens, no valid hexes, so we move on to the next option, which is Move Character. So to move the character, we're looking for a hex in the neighborhood of any Atoma unit or the Atoma's base, and a hex that has no enemy unit and no Atoma mech. So for any of these valid hexes, we're looking for the one that's the shortest distance from an Atoma combat unit. So in this case, the Atoma's character is adjacent to this combat unit. So it's only one space away. Remember in the case of a tie, it's gonna go to the hex that's closest to the factory. Since it's already in the factory, it's in the right spot right there. It's not gonna move. So we skip that option too. So then we move down to line two. We're gonna skip this first option because that only is for the Albion faction and we don't have that in this game. The next thing is the Atoma is gonna gain a worker and a coin. So I take a worker from the Atoma's faction map and place it on the Atoma's home base. And then the Atoma gains a coin, and I just place that on the Atoma's faction map. And there is no recruit bonuses in line three, and I haven't enlisted any of my recruits yet, so it doesn't matter to me. And then I just advance the tracker cube one space on the star tracker card. And that places me on Roman numeral two, and we know what that means. First, the Atoma gets to place a star next to the triumph track, and second, we shuffle all these cards, rotate them 180 degrees, and for the next Atoma's turn, it's gonna start with this reddish-orange Scheme 2 area. If you like solo games, there's a few other videos that I have put together, and they're on the Modern Cardboard channel, so you can see the whole video library there. Otherwise, we'll catch you in the next video.